All right, here we are again. Uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy is the name of the uh, course. Uh, Numbers Deuteronomy for Beginners, Faithfulness in the Face of Challenge. This is lesson number two in the series. Uh, and the title of this lesson is Preparing to Depart. So in our uh, previous lesson, uh, we began our study of the Old Testament books of Numbers and Deuteronomy by examining the background, the authorship, and the historical context of both of these books that were uh, written by Moses and set during the time that the Israelites spent in the wilderness after their uh, liberation from uh, Egyptian uh, captivity. We also looked at the similarities. Uh, uh, both books, for example, deal with the aspects of the law and the covenant between God and his people, the Israelites, and we looked at the differences. Numbers is a narrative describing the Israelites' journey and actions, and Deuteronomy is a compilation of teachings by Moses. Also, Numbers provides instructions, laws, and information about the people's conduct uh, in the desert while traveling, while uh, Deuteronomy is more of a, a monologue by Moses providing instruction to prepare the people as they uh, are ready to enter into and settle the, uh, the promised land. And then finally, we reviewed the various periods and major events that took place during the Jewish people's 40 year journey uh, in the wilderness from their departure uh, from uh, Mount Sinai uh, after receiving the 10 commandments all the way up to their arrival at the plains of Moab, uh, which is across the Jordan River uh, opposite from the city of Jericho. And then we ended the, uh, the lesson with the key themes found in both of these inspired texts. Uh, the four themes were obedience. Uh, in other words, blessings are linked uh, to obedience. Faith, the key element necessary to overcome obstacles. Uh, leadership, the necessity of having godly leaders to guide God's people, not only then, but even in today's uh, church, and of course, uh, the idea of covenant. God deals with his people, even today, through a set covenant. All right, so in the second lesson, we begin a closer study of the book of Numbers, beginning with the first four chapters, which uh, hopefully you have finished uh, reading. Uh, we begin by looking at uh, census number one. There are two censuses that were taken we're going to look at the first one uh, described in Numbers chapter 1, verses 1 to 46. As I said, there were two of these, uh, both described in the book of Numbers. The first of these is in uh, chapter 1. So let's do a little bit of reading, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month, in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, by their families, by their fathers' households, according to the number of names, every male head by head. From 20 years old and upward, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. With you, moreover, there shall be a man of each tribe, each one head, of his father's uh, household. So the first census of the uh, Israelites as recorded in the book of Numbers chapter one was conducted in a specific manner for several important reasons. First of which was uh, for the organization of the tribes. The uh, census was conducted to organize the 12 tribes of Israel according to their numbers. Each tribe had its own identity and responsibilities within the community. And so knowing the population of each tribe was crucial for assigning them their roles and territories as they journeyed through the wilderness and eventually they settled in the uh, promised land. Another reason for the census was for military preparedness. Uh, as I said, significant reason for the census was to assess the military strength of the Israelites. By counting the number of eligible men who could serve in the army, the leaders of Israel could determine their, uh, their military capabilities and strength. This information would be vital for defense against potential threats 
during their journey and of course when they went in to uh, conquer the uh, promised land. A third reason, inheritance and the distribution of resources. The uh, census also played a role in the distribution of land and resources among the tribes. The allotment of land once they arrived in the promised land was to be done proportionately according to the size of each tribe. By knowing the population of each tribe, the leaders could ensure a fair distribution of resources, enabling each tribe to sustain itself both economically and agriculturally. And so the manner in which the census was conducted involved counting only the men who were 20 years old and above, who were eligible for military service and who were considered adults in uh, Israelite society at that time. Each tribe was counted separately with a designated leader representing each tribe assisting in the counting process. This meticulous counting ensured accuracy and it also provided crucial demographic, demographic information for the organization and the governance of the Israelite community later on. Now, someone might ask this question, why count only the men? Would this not provide an incomplete number of actual people that comprised the Jewish nation? That's a good question. This is a, a natural question when we consider a census, especially a census taken today in our society, where our uh, primary goal is to determine just how many people there are in a particular city or in, a, in the country itself. The Jewish census, however, was not taken in order to count the total number of people. There were other reasons for the census taken in this particular manner. In the census taken by Moses in the book of Numbers, only the men were counted for several reasons beyond just assessing uh, military uh, capability. And I wanna share a couple of those with you. First, uh, were the cultural and legal uh, context or reasons. In ancient Israelite society, men are the ones who held positions of leadership and authority within the family and also within the community structure. The counting of men reflected the patriarchal nature of that society, where men were seen as the heads of the households and they were also responsible for various duties and obligations, including military service, uh, religious rituals, as well as legal uh, matters. Another reason why only the men were counted uh, was for lineage and inheritance purposes. The counting of men was closely tied to the concept of lineage and inheritance because inheritance laws and property rights were typically passed down through the male line in Jewish culture. Therefore, knowing the number of men in each tribe was essential for determining the distribution of land and resources among the tribes, as well as for preserving family lineage and inheritance rights. Once you received a portion of land, you know, once they entered the promised land, your family owned that land throughout the generations, throughout the generations of sons and you know, that, that uh, were, you know, would go down through, uh, through history. Uh, another uh, reason for uh, counting only the men, uh, and that was for representation uh, in government. Again, the census of men helped establish a system of representation and governance within the community. Uh, in many ancient societies, including Israel, decision-making and leadership roles were primarily held by men. Uh, by counting men, the leadership could accurately assess the demographic makeup of each tribe, and they could allo uh, allocate responsibility and representation accordingly. And then finally, one other reason uh, was to focus on household heads. The census likely focused on men because they were the primary providers for their families. In that society, there were very few single mothers. There were very few single people. And so uh, it was largely uh, a society of families and the men were uh, considered the head of uh, the, uh, the family. So counting men 
provided a practical way to gauge the overall population and also to assess the community's ability to support itself economically and uh, socially. So overall, the decision to count only men in the census was first and foremost done as a response to God's instruction. Aside from this, the male count also served cultural norms and legal considerations and, and practical concerns related to uh, governance, uh, resource uh, distribution within the community, and, and not a, an effort to simply determine just the total uh, number of, uh, of people as census are uh, done uh, today. Um, uh, we come to the, uh, not the problem, but the issue of the, the Levites in chapter one, verses uh, 47 to 54. I just want to read one verse here. It says, the Levites, however, were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. And so uh, the Levites were exempted from military census conducted among the other tribes of Israel. Instead of being counted for military service, they were dedicated to serving at the tabernacle and, and assisting the priests in their religious duties. They were responsible for dismantling, carrying, and setting up the tabernacle uh, whenever the Israelites moved during their journey through the uh, wilderness. The Levites were appointed to guard the tabernacle and its furnishings and uh, prevent unauthorized access to the tabernacle complex. They were also entrusted with the care of the sanctuary itself. And so their duties were essential for maintaining the spiritual and the ceremonial aspects of Israelite worship and ensuring the proper functioning of the tabernacle as the central place of worship for the people, someone had to do that job. And so they were not counted for governance or for uh, land inheritance uh, because their one task was to serve uh, at the uh, tabernacle. While in the wilderness, the tribe of Levi would camp directly around the tabernacle and serve as a last line of protection in the event of an attack or, or rebellion. Later on, we find out that they were not to receive a portion of land when the nation arrived in Canaan, but rather as servants of the tabernacle, the Lord himself would be their portion or their inheritance. This then meant that it would not be necessary to count them in the census uh, for military or inheritance or governance uh, purposes because they would, uh, they, they would not serve in the military, they would not receive any land, and they would not be called to uh, serve as uh, judges or lawyers or anything like that because their entire uh, time and energy was focused on serving uh, the temple. I read uh, a verse from Deuteronomy uh, that explains further. It says, the Levitical priests the whole tribe of Levi shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's offerings by fire and his portion. They shall have no inheritance among their countrymen. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses one and two. And so that was the, uh, the, that was the arrangement uh, with, the, um, uh, with the Levites. I want to talk about the camp arrangement, how they were camped uh, in the desert, uh, and read uh, something from Numbers chapter two. It says, uh, now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, the sons of Israel shall camp each by his own standard with the banners of their father's households. They shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. So in, in, in chapter two, uh, we read an interesting account of how the Israelites were organized. They may have left Egypt as a, a single large group hurriedly escaping their Egyptian slave masters, but once they were safely camped at Mount Sinai, God not only instructs Moses to group and count the adult males in each tribe, but he also organizes their positions uh, when they are camped out for periods of time. So they had specific places where they needed to be camped every time they would camp for a, a, a period of time. Each tribe uh, was to occupy a certain position around the tabernacle and to remain in that position when camped and while traveling as well. 
And so their encampments were to take the shape of a square with three tribes residing on each side. All the encampments were to surround the tabernacle in the middle. A little uh, imagery here. And so we see in uh, this uh, image, uh, the tabernacle complex, you know, uh, the curtains surrounding that, that rectangle there where the a tabernacle complex where the altar uh, is and, and then the, the holy place and then the holy of holies. So that was the tabernacle uh, complex. And so uh, we see uh, the tents of Moses and Aaron uh, located in the center of the encampment with the tabernacle. Uh, the, their tents were placed in front of the eastern entrance and camping with them were the sons of Aaron who were also priests. This diagram shows the placement of the tabernacle, the Levites, Moses and Aaron, as well as the 12 tribes camped around the tabernacle. So let's review some of the reasons for each group's particular position, which they maintained throughout the time that they were in the wilderness, whether camped in one place or on the move. And one thing I want to explain, we see Moses and Aaron, their camp and the priests uh, are there. Uh, and then we see the Kohathites, the uh, Gershonites and the Merarites. Well, these are three f Levite families. They're all Levites, but they're from different families. And so they camped uh, at other points uh, around the, uh, the tabernacle. Um, the uh, three sons of Levi that I just mentioned who migrated to Egypt along with Jacob and the rest of the family, as I mentioned, were uh, Gershon, Kohath and Merari. We read about that in Genesis 46, 11. Years later, after God dedicated the tribe of Levi to serve him as priests, he assigned responsibilities to each of these major families in regards to maintaining the tabernacle. This is why the Kohathites, the Gershonites and the Merarites were the nearest groups to set up their tents around the tabernacle on the south, on the west and on the north side. Note that the priests, Moses and Aaron, camped facing east, where the camp of Judah was also uh, uh, located. So let's look at the uh, placement of the tribes. First, we see the uh, eastern grouping. And so the first grouping of tribes in the wilderness encampment would face east towards the rising sun, and also which was the general direction that they would be traveling uh, in towards the promised land they would be the first to camp exactly on the east side of the tabernacle and they would be the first to leave the camp. Next in line to leave would be the tribes on the south side, then the Levites who served the tabernacle, then those on the west side, and finally those who were facing north. The wilderness tents from the tribes of Judah, Issachar and Zebulun were placed together on the eastern side of the tabernacle and were collectively under Judah's banner. So Judah, Issachar and Zebulun were the three youngest sons of Jacob, uh, Jacob's uh, wife, uh, uh, Leah. Judah was chosen to lead this first set of Israelites out of their wilderness camp, not only because it was the most numerous tribe of Jacob, but also because it was prophesied that the scepter of rule would never leave them. We read about that in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Uh, also Christ in the New Testament is called the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, Revelation chapter five, verse five. And so the number of fighting men on this side of the camp totaled 186,400. So we have a few you know, images of tents there, but certainly there were way more tents than this. This is uh, simply a graphic to give you an idea of where uh, they were uh, camped. Then uh, after the uh, Eastern grouping, there was the Southern grouping. Uh, the tribal camps of Reuben, Simeon and Gad were placed together on the Southern side of the tabernacle and were collectively under Reuben's banner. Reuben, born through Leah, was the oldest son of all of Jacob's children, with Simeon being the second oldest. Gad was born from Jacob and Leah's handmaid, Zilpah. Altogether, they totaled 
151,450 fighting men. Next, you had the Western uh, grouping. The Western side of the wilderness encampment contained the tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. They were collectively under the banner of Ephraim. Benjamin, as we know, was born of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Ephraim and Manasseh were the product of Rachel's son, Joseph, and his Egyptian wife. They were adopted by Jacob as full tribes. And we read about that in Genesis 48. This group of Israelites contained 108,100 fighting men. And then finally, we have the Northern grouping. The tribal camps of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, collectively under Dan's banner, were placed together on the northern side of the tabernacle. Dan is the oldest son of Jacob and Bilhah, one of Rachel's slaves. They totaled 157,600 men who could fight and were the last group in the wilderness to leave when they broke camp and, and left. They were the uh, they they uh, were the rear guard, if you wish. Uh, so according to the Bible, the total strength of Israel's wilderness camp army was 603,550 men. Someone will say, well, what about the Levites? Remember we talked about them? Uh, the tribe of Levi pitched their tents close to the wilderness tabernacle, you know, Gershon all the way around. Remember those I showed you in that, uh, in that graphic? Uh, they left the camp after the southern grouping of the tribes, but before the western grouping. They ended up marching in the very middle of all the tribes. And so you had uh, one group, uh, the eastern uh, tribes would uh, march out, and then the southern tribes would uh, march behind them. Then the uh, Levites with the tabernacle would be in the middle, so to speak. Then the uh, western tribes would then follow them, and the northern tribes would follow uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the rear. Uh, because God dedicated the Levites to serve as priests, he did not have them numbered along with Israel's wilderness camp uh, army. Again, we read that in Numbers 2.33. That said, some 38 years later, a second census was carried out by Moses where the Levites this time were counted. And uh, we'll cover that when we get to chapter uh, 26 and give you some details about, about that. Um, I want to talk about the role of the Levites and priests because uh, you know, information about them comes up quite often in the book of uh, Numbers. And so in Numbers uh, chapter three and four, the roles of the Levites and priests are described in uh, detail. In verse 39 of chapter three, Moses writes that the total number of males a month old and over among the three tribes descended from Levi was 22,000. From this number came the priests and the Levites who served at the tabernacle, each according to God's instructions. Now, because of time constraints, I'd like to briefly summarize the work and the responsibilities of these servants of God at the tabernacle. First of all, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the role of the priests. Of course, uh, the priests are the ones who perform the sacrifices. They were the descendants of Aaron. They were primarily responsible for offering sacrifices and also conducting rituals that were prescribed by God. They were the intermediaries between God and the people. They acted as intermediaries between the people of Israel and God, offering prayers and sacrifices on behalf of the community. Priests were also responsible for teaching the people the laws and the commandments of God. And then of course, they also ensured that the rituals were performed with strict adherence to the ritual purity laws, maintaining the sanctity and the purity of the tabernacle. The Levites had different duties. The Levites were appointed to assist the priests in their duties within the tabernacle, handling the sacrifices and cleaning the altar, different things like that. They also were the guardians of the tabernacle. They were responsible for guarding the tabernacle and its furnishings, ensuring uh, a sanctity. 
um, the Levites were tasked with transporting the various components of the tabernacle during the Israelites' journey and assembling them at each uh, location. They were also responsible for the general maintenance and care of the tabernacle and its equipment. After all, these things were, were physical things, you know, uh, construction things, uh, and many times were uh, uh, damaged or broken in, in travel, and so uh, the Levites were responsible for their repair. The various duties within each of these categories, however, were assigned according to each tribe. Uh, whether it be the tribe of the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merarites. For example, only the Kohathites could carry the objects from inside the Holy of Holies. On the other hand, only the Merarites could organize and carry the poles and the sockets upon which the drapes surrounding the tabernacle hung, and so on and so forth. So they each, each tribe had very specific duties as far as disassembling, carrying, and assembling, <clears throat> excuse me, the tabernacle. A word about the priestly lineage. Um, in the Old Testament, priests in Israel were primarily descended from the tribe of Levi, that's the tribe, which was divided into three main families. As I've mentioned before, the three main families, Kohath, Gershon, Merari. However, within the tribe of Levi, only descendants of Aaron were designated as priests. And so Aaron was a descendant of Kohath. So therefore priests in Israel were essentially a subset of the Kohathites. Therefore priests did not come directly from the Gershonites or the Merarites, but rather from the Kohathite lineage and only through the family of Aaron. Just to clarify that idea for you. And so these chapters provide a detailed enumeration of the specific duties assigned to both the Levites and the priests within the religious structure of ancient Israel, emphasizing their roles in the service of God and of course the maintenance of the uh, tabernacle. And so we arrive at the point of our lesson where we talk about lessons, you know, lessons that can apply to us today. And uh, you know, to tell you the truth, the material we covered today does not necessarily lend itself naturally to life lessons, since uh, the material contains mainly information about how God organized his people for camping and for travel. However, if you look, uh, there are always some, some things to learn from studying God's word. And so here are a few lessons for us that we can glean from even this section of the book. Here we go, lesson number one. Lesson number one is the importance of organization and orderliness. The meticulous organization of the Israelite camp and the allocation of specific duties to each tribe and family teach us the value of orderliness in our lives. Just as the Israelites were organized for their journey through the wilderness, we also should strive to organize our lives setting priorities and allocating time and resources uh, effectively. Uh, an organized life helps us deal with the challenges and chaos that this sinful world often throws at us without warning. Another lesson from this section, an unbelieving world requires that believers serve and cooperate with each other. I mean, the, the roles assigned to the Levites and priests highlight the importance of service and cooperation within the community of believers. Each individual had a specific role to play in the functioning of the tabernacle and their collective efforts assured a smooth operation of uh, worship and the various rituals that God had given them. Similarly, as modern believers, we are called to serve one another and work together for the advancement of God's kingdom. This teaches us the significance of humility, teamwork, and of course, mutual support in our Christian walk. Churches that default to gossip and criticism when times are difficult don't honor God and they don't grow either. And one more lesson, faithfulness in small tasks leads to greater responsibilities. The Levites were entrusted with various tasks related to the tabernacle, from transporting its components 
to maintaining its sanctity. This illustrates the principle that faithfulness in small or seemingly insignificant tasks can lead to greater responsibilities and blessings uh, from God. The point I'm making is as believers today, uh, we should be faithful in whatever God has entrusted to us, whether that be uh, mowing the lawn around the church building or cleaning something or fixing or teaching a class or preaching a sermon or perhaps comforting those who are hurting. Uh, uh, we should do these things in a faithful uh, manner because God will equally reward faithfulness and diligence in every task. Uh, the guy who's mowing, uh, mowing the lawn and the guy who's preaching the sermon and, 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 the, and the person who's comforting the dying in the hospital, all of these will receive a similar reward from the Lord because it's not based on the task you do, it's based on the faithfulness with which you do that task. Okay, well that's our lesson uh, for today as we enter in the book of uh, Numbers. Uh, let me give you an assignment. Assignment is, first of all, reread Numbers one to four. You read it in preparation for the lesson. Now you have information about you know, that material, which gives, uh, hopefully gives you a better view of it. If you read it once again, it'll make a whole lot more sense to you. So I encourage you to reread Numbers one to four and then read Numbers uh, chapters five to 12 in preparation for our next lesson next time. So thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you uh, next time. Bye-bye.